welcome to our Christmas telling. First of all, just fill your cup up with some of your drink before we begin. So we begin by drinking from the first cup. This is to sanctify the service, to offer it to God as an act of worship. In Hebrew, it's called the Kiddush. This is also the cup of blessing. It's customary to begin these services with a blessing, and here it is. Blessed is the Lord God, King of the universe, who creates the fruit of the vine. Please take a drink from your cup. when a celebration of this type is being held in your own home. At this point, the lady of the household kindles the festival light and recites a traditional blessing. Blessed are you, Lord God, king of the universe who has sanctified us with your holy spirit and has given us jesus the messiah amen the prophet isaiah said the people walking in darkness have seen a great light on those living in the land of deep darkness a light has dawned we say together the words printed at section one on your printed sheet we say together this is the light of promise. Now, please tear off a, a small piece of your bread and hold it in your hand, but don't eat it just quite yet. The light was promised to arrive at a specific place. This place is to be Beit Lechem, the house of bread, also known as Bethlehem. The prophet Micah said, but you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. We share this bread to remember this fact, but first a blessing. Blessed is the Lord God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. Now, you can eat your bread. The light was going to be a man of sorrows. Again, the prophet Isaiah says, he grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him, he was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities, the punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. And we commemorate this through the tears which are represented by the salt water. Let's take some more bread and dip it in the salt water and eat it. The light was going to be born of a virgin, a lady of purity. Isaiah again. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. Emmanuel, God with us. The Messiah was to be born of a virgin. We commemorate this through the purity of the oil. Let's all take some more bread and dip it in the oil and eat it.
And so now it's time to light the second candle. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. This is the light of the Annunciation the announcing of the coming of the Messiah. We say together the words at point two on your sheets. Light is coming into the world. In a family setting, the youngest members of the household would now ask some questions. The first question they would ask is this. How did the story of Jesus begin? Please tell us. Well, the answer is found in the Gospel of Matthew. This is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he'd considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. The children would then ask, why did he give him the name Jesus? Well, in those days, people didn't speak English. Instead, they spoke in the languages of Aramaic and Hebrew. In Hebrew, his actual name was Yeshua. Which prompts the next question. What did this name, Yeshua, actually mean? Well, if we continue reading in the book of Matthew, it says this. And you are to give him the name Jesus. Yeshua, because he will save his people from their sins. His Hebrew name, Yeshua, actually means God saves. So his name would have great meaning to them. You are to give him the name God saves, because he will save his people from their sins. Now we're going to share together in a song. We're going to sing if you're at home and hum if you're at church the carol O Holy Night. O Holy Night, the stars are brightly shining it is the night of our dear Saviour's birth long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appeared and the soul felt its worth a thrill of hope The weary world rejoices For yonder breaks A new and glorious morn Fall on your knees Oh, hear the angel voices Taught us 
to love one another His Lord is love and His gospel is peace Change shall He break for the slave is our brother and in His name all oppression shall cease At this point in the service, it's time to light the third candle. Once the third candle's lit, we say together the words at section three on your sheets. Light has come into the world. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favour rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see the thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherd said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. In a moment, it's going to be time to drink from the second cup. So refill your glasses so that you've got something to drink. This will be the cup of life. Let us celebrate the birth of Jesus with the traditional blessing for the birth of a boy. 
Blessed is the Lord God, King of the universe, who is good and brings us good. And we're going to raise a toast. We say together the words at point four on your printed sheets. Light has come into the world. Le came to life. We're going to share together in another song. for the fourth and final question which is what happened next please tell us after jesus was born in bethlehem in judea during the time of king herod magi from the east came to jerusalem and asked where is the one who has been born king of the jews we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him when king herod heard this he was disturbed and all jerusalem with him when he had called together all his people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means the least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd the, my people Israel. Then, Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. 
After they'd heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. You have some things on your tables in front of you to represent those gifts. The gift of gold tells us that Jesus is born to be king. You also have a little pot with some cotton wool in it, which has been squirted with frankincense room spray. Have a sniff of that. The gift of frankincense tells us that Jesus is born to be righteous and holy and to offer himself as a sacrifice for us. And you've also got another little pot with a tea bag of bitter herbs in it. That's there to represent the myrrh. Take a moment to breathe in that smell too. The gift of myrrh speaks of bitterness, suffering and affliction. It tells us that Jesus was born to die, as it's used as part of Jewish burial customs. In John chapter 19, Nicodemus brought around 75 pounds of it to place on Jesus' body. That would be the equivalent of several hundred of these little tea bags. But others were going to die too. We continue the story of Jesus. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. When they had gone, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said, take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, Out of Egypt I called my son. When Herod realised that he'd been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious, and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity, who were two years old and under, in accordance with the time he'd learned from the Magi. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Rama, weeping and great mourning. Rachel, weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted, because they are no more. Take a moment now to fill your glass again, ready for sharing the third cup. This is the cup of sorrow. As we drink it, let us remember the sacrifice that Jesus was to make for us on the cross. Let's also remember the slaughter of those innocent children killed at the order of King Herod. And maybe we can also remember those family and friends who have passed away this year. But first, a blessing. Blessed is the Lord God, King of the universe, who creates the fruit of the vine. Take a drink from your cup. Now we're going to spend a short time in prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we reflect on how you gave your only Son to suffer and die for our salvation. But we know that he rose from the dead to bring us new life. And so we offer our prayers for those who are suffering and dying in the world today, that they might be relieved of their suffering and have new life. We pray today for the people who are persecuted for their religion, their colour or race, for those who have been abused in the slave trade. We pray for the spirit of courage to help them move forward in their lives. We pray for our leaders, that decisions that are made 
are for the good of the people they serve and not for individual gain. May the light of Christ guide them. We pray that you will speak into the hearts of those who abuse the power they have over others in the nations and in the household. In these difficult times when there are more people suffering domestic abuse. We pray for all the charities we know who are helping people this Christmas. The Nomad Trust helping those who are homeless for the food banks, helping those who are struggling to feed their families. And we give thanks for those who have generously given gifts of food and presents for families in need. We pray for people who are in darkness and fear over the COVID-19 virus. Help us to reach out to those we know with the love of Christ. Prompt us, Lord, to know how to help and support each other, maybe with a word of encouragement, a card or a phone call. Father, as we share the work of Christ your Son, help us to share the good news of new life in Christ with all those we meet. Heavenly Father, we ask our prayers in his name. Amen. Life's full of mysteries and miracles, isn't it? Like, why doesn't my computer always do what I tell it? It worked yesterday, why not today? And the miracle? Ah, thank goodness, it's working again. Don't know how that happened. We've just been sharing in a celebration of the very biggest mystery and miracle ever. The time when the almighty, immeasurable, all-knowing and all-powerful God of all creation came to earth in the body of a weak, vulnerable, helpless little human baby, born in an occupied country to a poor unmarried girl and her fiancé in a borrowed outhouse, to live our life and die our death, and then to defeat that death, so we can share in his eternal life. A mystery and a miracle of the highest order. Over the years, perhaps we've become familiar with the Christian Christmas story, and maybe it doesn't amaze us like it ought to anymore. But really and truly, it's an absolute game changer. Most people have heard of the Ten Commandments. They're a set of rules given by God through Moses, which give a template for righteous living they've sort of got a bit of a bad press. Actually, they're an excellent foundation to build our lives on, but they're often thought of as just being a list of thou shalts and thou shalt nots, issued by a stern and forbidding deity. The Christmas story helps us to see God in a very different light. Later in his life, Jesus himself, talking to a Jewish teacher, said that he didn't come into the world to condemn it, but that everyone who trusts and believes in him would have eternal life. That statement's followed by what are probably some of the best known words in the Bible. If you want to find them, they're in the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. And they say, this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. God sent his Son into the world, not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. The readings we've shared together during the telling have told us quite a lot about the true meaning of the Christmas story. I should think that nearly everyone must know about the three gifts brought to the baby Jesus by the wise men. Gold, frankincense and myrrh. And we've seen how they show what the Magi, wise men from eastern lands, maybe Persia, understood about this very special baby they'd come to see. But there are some other things that are perhaps a bit easier to miss if we're not looking out for them. Some Bibles talk about the birth of Jesus Christ, some about Jesus the Messiah. 
Both terms mean the same thing. Christ isn't Jesus' last name. Christ is just a Greek translation of the Hebrew word Messiah, and it means anointed one. Jesus is the anointed one, promised hundreds of years before through the Old Testament prophets in the family line of King David, who was Israel's greatest king, who will restore Israel and rule justly. They also tell us that his very name, Jesus, given to Joseph for him by the angel, means God saves. What did this anointed one come to save us from? Well, anything and everything that makes us less than what we were created to be. From the power of sin and guilt, which puts a barrier between us and God, and from everything which degrades, diminishes and oppresses us. As we trust in Jesus, get to know him and let him rule in our hearts and lives, we come to see how precious we are in God's sight. How much he loves and cares for us. And through the Holy Spirit who comes to fill us, we're given the power to triumph over everything that would destroy us. And then there's that other name for Jesus, Emmanuel. God with us, God among us. He didn't just tell us what to do to dig ourselves out of the pits we find ourselves in. He didn't even just send us help. He came. He got his hands dirty and lived in the midst of the dirt, grime, suffering and disease of human existence. He experienced sadness and sorrow as well as joy and happiness. He knows what it is to be cold and vulnerable as well as comfortable and secure. He knew loneliness and friendship, acceptance and rejection. He experienced fear and apprehension, especially as he faced his death on the cross. He even knew temptation, as strong as any will ever face. The only thing he didn't know was sin, although he saw and experienced the power and destructive force it can have in the lives of the people around him. Rescuing them and us from that was what he came for. It was what he lived for, what he died for, what he rose again for, and it's what he lives for still. This Christmas, do you feel like you need rescuing from something? Do you need restoring, renewing, setting free? Jesus is your man. That first Christmas in Bethlehem, there was no room at the inn. This Christmas, Amidst the tat and the tinsel, will he find room in your heart? If you invite him in, he'll come. And if you want him to, he'll stay. And he'll renew and restore and remake you. And he'll be Emmanuel to you. God with us. God with you. In the words of that famous carol, all glory be to God on high, and to the earth be peace, good will henceforth from heaven to men begin and never cease. God bless you.
Top up your glasses again. It's time for the fourth cup. This is the cup of celebration. We rejoice that the Saviour is in the world. Blessed is the Lord God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us with your Holy Spirit and has given us Jesus the Messiah to be the light of the world. Take a drink from your cup. And so we come to the end of our service and our celebration. Let me share with you another ancient blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. And may I wish you a happy and blessed Christmas. Amen. <laughs>